Well, I'm also here, it's partly sponsored by Reebok. Um, all the big major sports companies are interested in promoting physical uh, fitness because we've entered the, the real sedentary phase in, in uh, our cultures. Uh, four years ago, the National Institute of Medicine came up with a new diagnosis called sedentaryism. And under it are the top 10 killers in the United States, either particularly caused by or significantly contributed to by our lifestyle differences that have evolved in the past 30, 40 years. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's something. And Reebok is one of the companies that, that uh, they, they, for the 2012 marketing campaign adopted my book. And we started a program called Box uh, about two and a half years ago. Now I have 3,000 kids in Boston, New York, Washington, D.C. in a preschool play program uh, run by the community. Uh, and Reebok supporting that and supporting me. They have really bought into it uh, and they've changed their whole focus in, instead of looking at the celebrity athlete, trying to make every, everybody the everyday athlete. Uh, to, and, and, and their phrase is, fitness is my sport. Um, and you'll see a lot of, of that in the future. But anyway, <clears throat> I always bring my dog along. <laughs> uh, he's a Jack Russell and he came one day and I had to come up with a name so I went on a three mile run. Because when, you, when you're exercising you get really creative. So I had to come up with the right name. So I was really pounding it went from the three mile run, thinking about all kinds of possible names, came back and named him Jack. So, uh, the creativity really works. Now, the Jack Russell tribe, they're all, they're, they're distinguished because they all have attention deficit disorder. And uh, I've been writing about, talking about it, written three books on attention deficit disorder and its effect on people and, and uh, we sort of broke the field open back in the early 90s. Uh, so I, I knew that Jack had ADD um, and uh, we took him to the vet and of course he prescribed Ritalin. But uh, <laughs> instead I put him on a very intensive exercise program. And he'll be back later to illustrate some points. But, uh, and there he is again and there's my website and a picture of my book, but the, the johnrady.com is, is a place to go for, uh, it, we're, it's been in dormant for the past four years because I've been on the road, but we're getting, bringing it back to life, but there's videos and lots of resources on there, as well as sparkinglife.org, which is another m much more uh, wordy website. But anyway, <clears throat> to begin with, I'm very passionate about this subject because I've learned so much about how exercise affects the brain. And one of the big points to remember is that we are still hunter-gatherers. It's only been 10,000 years that we've been off the plains and savannas. And our genes, our basic prescription, has not changed all that much in 10,000 years. We used to say the genes change at glacial speed, but we can't say that anymore because the glaciers are moving faster and now. But we were hunter-gatherers. We didn't train for marathons or triathlons or uh, go to boot camp because that was part of life every day. Uh, we had to. You had to move. Uh, it's estimated that we moved anywhere from 8 to 14 miles per day on average. Some days you wouldn't move at all. Other days you'd be moving 30, 40 miles. You had foraging, sprinting, swimming, lifting all the time. Everybody's on the move. We're not doing that now. We're sitting and things have changed quite radically. When, <clears throat> only one brain slide, so don't freak. Uh, it, 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 there, as we were hunter gatherers for half a million years, we developed our brains and our hu human brains. And we developed our brain mainly from this red splotch here out. Uh, uh, this is our motor strip. Everything we added on as we got better and better movers. 
we got more discrete, more defined, more saving energy, more uh, planful, more organized. All that added this part of our brain on right behind your forehead. That's our frontal cortex. It, it's a movement cortex. It's to guide our movements. Then we added language. It sort of came up along and that became our thinking brain such that <clears throat> this uh, August neuroscientist said some years ago now, that which uh, we call thinking is really the evolutionary internalization of movement, meaning that as we develop to be more precise, better movers, adapting to more and more environments and learning, uh, we use those same nerve cells to think. Okay, so there's really not a big difference between thinking and movement. They're the same nerve cells. And we see this, and with our fancy scans now, every time we move, by standing here, for instance, is exciting my brain cells that are involved with movement because I'm standing, my muscles are firing rather than sitting, more of it. The large skeletal muscles, the core muscles, it's turning on the, the motor cortex and motor areas but it also feeds forward to the very important part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, which is where we think, where we take in new information, where we plan, where we organize, where we evaluate consequences. That's a very important part of the brain, but it gets turned on by just moving. And it's said <clears throat> by some people that, that uh, I'm probably seven to 10% better as a thinker, a performer, everything standing rather than sitting. Just the act of standing uh, improves my brain function. Now, the problem is that we've evolved, or our co-evolution has, has happened, and we have all of our cyber slaves, and we are sitting all the time, and this is a big, big part of our problem, and we have to uh, combat that. We didn't have to... It, we, we, I wouldn't be talking about this 40 years ago because people weren't sitting like they are now. And it's a big problem. Now, when we were, <clears throat> when we were hunter-gatherers, we also evolved these genes that are called thrifty genes. Genes that direct us to do two things that have led to our obesity crisis, or part of, of the obesity crisis. One, to eat the highest caloric food that we can find and two, to store it, not waste energy, not waste any of the, 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 the food that we have or the, the, the energy sources that we have. So we're, we're sort of not, if we can take a break, we're taking a break. And this is the biggest problem that we have now. And then, of course, we go for the five stacker and we go for, you know, the KFC and all that uh, because we're sort of driven to, to do that because Think about it, if you're hunter-gatherer, if you have a juicy piece of fatty stuff, you're gonna consume it because you might be starving tomorrow. They were always on that edge. They were always on the move looking for more food. So, uh, you know, this, this is, it's not our, uh, it's not our, it wasn't a choice for us to become the society that we have. And by the way, this is around the world. Every, every country is beginning to have problems with obesity, especially in their young. Uh, and kids overweight in India, okay? If you're not starving, there are 60% of them are starving, so you can't count them, but the middle class, they're increasing their obesity rate, one to 2% a year, uh, because the kids are sitting, and they're also the sugar drinks have invaded. But <clears throat> my, passion for exercise came because I'm in Boston and that's the home of the Boston Marathon and we did a lot of work early on on looking at why the marathoners have this nirvana experience and this endorphin rush and all that kind of stuff. So I was always interested in it but there was always something missing and because we knew that exercise helped modulate mood and anxiety and stress and aggression and all that kind of stuff but Cognition wasn't part of the picture yet. Until 1995, when Carl Kopman out at the University of uh, California of Irvine was part of an international MacArthur uh, study looking at what prevented the onset of Alzheimer's disease. And
And they found there were three factors. One, ideal weight. Two, continuous learning. And three, exercise. Uh, and exercise, even when you factored out the cardiovascular positives, the lowering the blood pressure and all that, if you factored them out, exercise still was a very, what we call robust indicator of preventing the onset of cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease. So Cotman was a member of this team. He went back and he said, okay, let's find out what's going on. And he got some rats to run in uh, their uh, running wheels, taught them how to do it. Uh, and then began to measure stuff. Pre-tested them on their SATs, the mice SATs. Uh, let them run. They ran, at the end of seven days, they were running two kilometers a night. Okay, and then they tested them again. Their SAT scores up, what, about t up 10%. 10% improvement in their SAT scores. They also looked at their brains. That's why they use rats and not people. They it opened them up and saw that their brains were beginning to get more, their, their cortex was beginning, was getting thicker. And then they looked at, uh, did further studies of eight weeks of having these rats run, and their SET scores up, went up 20%. And then they really got a look, look at their brains, and their brains were different. They were much more connected on the cortex, and a part of their brain was bigger the hippocampus, which is sort of the central station for memory and learning in our brains, was bigger. Well, and they also measured this new fangled thing back then, BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, hugely important. Uh, we had just discovered it maybe 10 years before this, and we didn't know about it, certainly when I was in medical school, but it, it's something that, it's, that, that really is key and important for brain growth and brain health and lots of other things. Um, and, and what we make it, when our 100 billion brain cells fire, each time they fire, we make this BDNF. It's sort of God's gift to us uh, to help fertilize our brain cells, to keep them young and perky, to help make new ones, to guide them. Uh, it, it, it regulates our brain very nicely. Every time our brain cells fire, well, Fact is, when we exercise, we fire more of those brain cells than in any other activity. Thus, our BDNF levels are higher, which is what we see, what, what he's found here, that they were three times the baseline in their brains uh, when they, uh, after the eight-week study. So this was quite amazing, and, and it led to a real revolution in neuroscience, because here is a direct way of affecting the brain. Uh, with something so seemingly not involved, which was exercise, physical exercise. And it now, before 1995, I was uh, uh, interested in exercise and its effect on the brain and mood and everything. There might have been 10 papers a month in the science literature. Since then, it's just been a tsunami of, of research, research all over the world, all over uh, the neuroscience, okay, disciplines in psychology and all the, uh, all the rest, looking at the brain, looking at mood, so that nowadays, every week, I get sent at least 40 new abstracts a week on exercise and its effect on the brain. So it, it, it's powerful. It really does affect the brain, and one of the things that it does do is increase the BDNF. So, this set off a whole slew of interest in preventing the onset of cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease, and I'll just quickly go over it. Lots of papers. Early stuff was like preventing us boomers from getting, having our cognition decline, preventing the onset of Alzheimer's disease. So scads of studies, scads, 1,600 studies were reviewed recently looking at cognition and exercise by the Mayo Clinic, and they found that it was very positive, and it was a very preventive of cognitive, cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease. Well, this one study shows <clears throat> the tip of the iceberg, but it really illustrates the, the point of the University of Illinois, where they got a bunch of 69-year-olds, put them on an exercise program that had previously been sedentary, did scans before and after, uh, a, a six-month course of exercising three times a week, on treadmills, and uh, they did the elderly SATs, and their scores went up about 11%, okay? 
But these areas, this blue and yellow areas, are actual areas of brain growth in six months. Okay, brain growth. Uh, more, in some places, more cells. In others, just uh, more connections. It's, it makes your brain healthy to grow. Now we're, we're starting to, to look at kids. This is a, a study that just came out uh, <clears throat> looking at uh, a group of 12-year-olds, uh, dividing them, or 10-year-olds, dividing them into two groups, those that could finish a 400-meter run and those that couldn't, okay? And they called the one fit and the other unfit. There's scores on a lot of neuropsych tests were better in the fit kids. And they looked at their hippocampus, which is again the sort of central station for memory and learning in our brains. It was bigger in the fit kids by a, a statistically significant amount already at the age of 10. So just by being fit, that was, that was the only demographic that was different. So we've known about this. We've known about this, that, that uh, the Greeks knew about it, that uh, we, uh, if we're moving, we, we have to pay attention to our bodies and our physical uh, habitus, as well as our brains to be the complete and, and uh, perfect uh, person. Well, I got really switched on to this in 2004 when I learned about this school uh, 60 miles west of Chicago called Naperville. Uh, Naperville District 203. And I learned about it from Super Size Me, the movie, because I, uh, they interviewed the, the uh, guy who started to change the program 20 years before the PE program at Naperville, uh, and Phil Lawler, and he quoted me. So I was very interested, right? Uh, and uh, uh, because I had written a whole bunch of stuff about how exercise makes the, a miracle grow for the brain, which is what I call BDNF. Um, anyway, so I learned about this school because they have 19,000 kids in their school district. At that point, 3% of them were overweight. The next year, they, uh, as a uh, college went in to see if they could find an obese kid in their 6,500 high school students, not one because they had evolved this PE program that was based on physical fitness, individual physical fitness first. That was the highest priority. And they added, it was a developmental process. It wasn't all, boom, we're gonna do it. It took a lot of time convincing, and now it's one of the most important uh, subjects in that school. But anyway, what really got me interested was that they're 3% versus 33% on average, okay, at that point. Now it's 37% in the United States. 3% <clears throat> is still 3% for them because they do physical fitness kinds of exercising every day. That's part of their daily diet. And what, but as I say, what really got me interested is that they, a couple years before, had taken the international science and math test as a country. We take that, all countries take that every three years. The US scores in the mid-teens uh, on both science and math. Well, anyway, they lobbied to take it as a country. 99% of their kids took it. They scored number one in the world in science and number six in math. That got me on a plane to go see this place. <laughs> and I've been back every year ever since. It's amazing. Everybody who goes out there said, Gosh, I wish I would die and be reborn and go to Naperville, because it's it is amazing. the 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 program is amazing. It evolved over time. It didn't just happen. It it's an upper middle class area, so it had resources. But it took time for this to develop, and they really have evolved an amazing program. But we knew about the fact that, uh, and and by the way, they they spend the median amount per student per year in the state of Illinois. That means, for, for education, that means that there are schools paying twice as much in the North Shore schools in North Shore Chicago, spending twice as much per student per year for their for school. And they're right with them. They're A++ rating. They're, they compete with those schools for the highest SAT, ACT, National Merit Fellows. They really do their job. <coughs> so it, 
here we have uh, fitness, fit kids that are doing well. And we've known this for years, we've known this, but we haven't known it, right? We, I mean, it's, it's been in the background. In the state of California, they do fitness grams on a million kids a year and have been doing it since 2000. And they, they look, you're familiar with the fitness gram, I assume? This here at Texas, uh, Dr. Cooper, a friend of mine, yeah, fitness gram basically looks at six different fitness standards. And you either meet it or you don't. And <clears throat> what they found was that there was this direct correlation in test scores. The fitter the kid, the better they did in math and in language arts. And that's been, this is an example, but it's like that every single year. Two years ago, Dr. Cooper did uh, one or 2.1 million kids in Texas on the fitness gram and found the same kind of correlation along with uh, grades, uh, along with school attendance, uh, and a decreasing slope with discipline problems and tardiness, which is what we find all the time. Now, <clears throat> to cap it off, recently there's, there's this, this, this wonderful epidemiologic study that came out of Sweden by Maria Aberg, who looked at 1.2 million boys. They tested them in, when they were 15 in, in school, uh, tested their cardiovascular function, their muscle function, and their IQ, as well as some other cognitive measures. They retested the boys when they were 18 as they were entering compulsory military service on the same test. And what they found, that if your cardiovascular function improved, so did your IQ, so did your cognitive function. And they found this in brothers and in uh, non-identical twins and in, in, in that year, in those years that so they looked at, 650 sets of identical twins. And they found the same correlation. That is, if you improve cardiovascularly, you were more like, statistically more likely to improve your IQ as well as your function on cognitive testing. And if you didn't, you were more likely to stay the same. And, and then they looked at their, followed them through. Uh, after uh, deployment, they, the, those that improved during what would be our high school years, their cardiovascular function had a higher academic achievement overall. And further on, higher socioeconomic standing uh, down the road. So it was a dramatic, dramatic proof that exercise and being fit makes you more, enables you to learn better. Now, <clears throat> this is our problem, right? This is the kind of problem that we face. This Southern California course, but uh, you know, it's something that we add on to our lives, not something that's part of our lives. And we have to, we have to schedule it in, and and we, you know, uh, make it easy for ourselves. Now, <clears throat> exercise has dramatic effect on our ability to learn. It optimizes our brain for learning. It works in three different ways on the brain systems on all of our cells, our 100 billion nerve cells, and it promotes new cell, brain cell growth. Uh, you're all familiar with neurogenesis? Everybody shaking their head, okay. So it promotes nerve cell growth, and it's really quite dramatic, and that's what turns everybody on. Now, <clears throat> our, we're learning how to stimulate our brain, how to make it work better, but unfortunately, we think of it in terms of using drugs. And this is, a, this is a drug class, right? And so we think of it in those terms uh, rather than uh, the best way to think of it, the exercise pill, which is a real uh, useful uh, and wonderful way of, of making our brains function the best, optimizing our brains to function. Now, to show you what happens, this is a group <clears throat> of 20, 12 year olds, and this is just a, a QEEG, and they're, they're just looking at brain activity. This is them sitting. This is 20 minutes later after they've walked for 20 minutes, just walking. 
you know, 55 to 60 percent of their maximum heart rate. They're not sweating. They're not. They're just lollygagging around. Then they took their their readings again, and you can see the pretty colors. They're different. That means more activity. So just by walking, their brains are more active. Their brains are ready, more ready to take in information and to learn. We think, uh, but instead. Uh, we use pills to jimmy up our arousal to, you know, Red Bull, five-hour energy, it's a, you know, co coffee, uh, or our stimulants, uh, Adderall, Ritalin, like Jack wanted to be put on Ritalin, because it increases this, one of our neurotransmitters, norepinephrine, uh, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the major ones, and norepinephrine, when, we, when we're moving, it immediately elevates to, to help uh, us stay aroused, stay awake, stay focused, uh, be sharper. And, and so movement makes our norepinephrine levels grow up, as well as dopamine. It's a partner to norepinephrine in, in addressing the attention system. But it also is very involved with muscle action, with our movement, Parkinson's disease is, is an absence or a decreasing amount of dopamine, to give you an example. Uh, uh, it's very involved in the movement system in the entire brain. But it also is a reward neurotransmitter and the motivation neurotransmitter uh, and the addiction neurotransmitter. All the addictive substances that we know of come through dopamine eventually. Uh, and so there's a, a problem there. So. We know that exercising increases this almost immediately. And over time, both norepinephrine, dopamine, and the rest of the things that I'll talk about are not only acutely increased, but you make more enzymes, you make more receptors, you, you make more of this stuff for later. So you improve overall, the fitter you are, you improve your brain function. And of course, serotonin, uh, you know, 1989 when it came out, Prozac was a big rage, L tryptophan before that, increasing our serotonin levels. Well, when we exercise, we get an acute burst of, of serotonin in our brains because we're using those nerve cells. As well, if you're exercising enough, you change the dynamics of the body and you get a secondary boost in, ser in serotonin in the brain from allowing more L-tryptophan to cross over the blood vein barrier. So <clears throat> we in psychiatry have been fascinated and addicted to these three neurotransmitters. This is all of where all of our drugs have been targeted. Dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. So exercise does the same thing. It does it quicker. I've always said it out of exercise is like taking a little bit of Ritalin or Adderall and a little bit of Prozac because it does the same thing, uh, only it does it very holistically. Now, a little physiology, kinesiology. When we're moving, what happens? When we're moving, when we're exercising, we stress our muscles. We break muscle fibers, right? You guys all know that probably. And we release all kinds of things because there's this wonderful uh, period that we have called recovery uh, and, and regrowth. Uh, and it, so we release this stuff, IG, IGF-1, FGF-2, to help our muscles recover. Well, these factors, along with uh, VEGF, which helps make new uh, blood cells or, or, or new uh, capillaries, because it's like saying, okay, we need more glucose in here because this is stress. The muscle's stressed. We need to build it. We need more fibroblasts uh, and, and tubules to be made. Uh, so we turn, turn it on with all these factors. But these guys, IGF-1, FGF-2, and VEGF, go up to the brain. And they are important for brain function. Just as they turn on to make muscle, they also turn on those stem cells in the brain that make new nerve cells the process of neurogenesis. If you block FGF2 and VEGF from getting into the brain, you don't make no more uh, st new, new stem cells. You don't make it. It's necessary for the body to supply this. 
as well. We have all these other factors that, that come out, including VDNF and the uh, cytokines that have a repair process and they have an effect in, in the brain. But what's really cool <clears throat> is when we, evolution has given us this possibility of continuing to, to move and to exercise and to run or to lift even when we're damaging our muscles because we don't know we're damaging our muscles because we release endorphins, which are the endogenous morphine, and it's where we learned about in the 80s and uh, 70s and 80s, where heroin, Percocet, Oxycontin, where they bind, okay? Uh, because their pain, and morphine is there for, to block the pain signals in the periphery, along with a partner. Have you all heard of endocannabinoids? I see a couple of heads shaking. Does that mean everybody? Yeah, okay. So we didn't know about this we, uh, some years before, but now we know that endocannabinoids are also released. So you got morphine and, of course, marijuana uh, helping to block directly the pain uh, information going up to the brain and continuing with what we're doing. And, and we thought, well, so we began to measure this endorphins, which we knew about back in the 80s, and a lot of our marathoners and looking at their really elevated endorphin levels, but that was in the periphery. That was just in the body. Now, they don't cross into the brain, but the endocannabinoids do, and all these other factors, a lot of them do as well. But we have our own endorphin uh, uh, nerve cells in, in the brain. We release it there. We release the endocannabinoids from the brain. But we also get it from the periphery. We also get it from the body. And so the movement then helps regulate the way our brains are working. So we, we create more of this endorphin stuff. And then we, we learned all about the endorphin rush. That's the nirvana experience that these marathoners get. And it's, we thought it's all about endorphins. And that's why we feel so much better. However, the norepinephrine, you know, norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin are also elevated. That contributes. And then, of course, we have our own endocannabinoids, which also contribute to our feeling of well-being uh, naturally in, when we exercise. And then we have our, my favorite, VDNF, uh, which is the mother of all growth factors in terms of the brain. It keeps our brain young and perky. It keeps it ready to grow. And so we have our, our brains working. Now we look at our brains as muscles. The brain is a muscle. It responds as a muscle. It likes to be used. If it lies dormant, it erodes. It erodes. So you really want to keep it going. And exercise is one great way to keep it going. Uh, to challenge the brain constantly to grow. So we, we see this in many, many studies, in animals and in humans, that exercise makes the learner a better learner. Puts them in their chair. It keeps them there. It keeps them motivated. It keeps the decreases their fidgetiness, lessens fatigue, improves motivation. This is from a science perspective, not just oh, this is what what's happening. We know what happens with uh, in, increased norepinephrine and serotonin and other things. Our motivation levels go up, uh, combating depression, improving self-esteem, etc. All which makes the learner a better learner. And it all turns on, exercise, as I say, turns on this front part of the brain, the control part of the brain, the CEO of the brain, that uh, gets turned on when we exercise to help us parse apart information, take it in, figure it out, plan, learning from our mistakes, uh, and help us maintain our focus as well as suppress uh, impulses. So with exercise, at the synaptic level, we have 100 billion nerve cells and at least 1,000 connections or 1,000 synapses per nerve cell so that the math gets jiggy. Uh, you can't even do it. So, but our, all these growth factors, it, when we exercise, make this, this area fertile. 
And there have been three Nobel Prizes awarded in the past 15 years to say we learn when our brain cells grow. Our brain cells have to change. They have to grow for us to encode, to learn anything. And we optimize the environment, and this is what they mean, for this area to grow. We make more neurotransmitter, we make more receptors. We actually and, and, and as, as make it fertile so it can do that. And we even make uh, the brain cells connect more, easier, to grow new arms to join each other. So, and it's the building block of learning. And then, of course, we know that we create more brain cells every day. Uh, but exercise is the champ in promoting new brain cell growth, especially in the hippocampus. And this is a slide showing that, which basically says we're increasing uh, the, the number of new functioning nerve cells that we have, especially in the hippocampus and probably in some other areas of the brain. Now this is a study out of New York where they took the average age 30 year olds uh, who were sedentary, started them exercising for three months, four times a week, getting their heart rates up there 40 minutes. They did scans before and after. This is a, a picture of a, a part of their brain uh, in a scanner. And this area is an area of brain cell growth. This little area in the hippocampus grew 30% in three months of training. So it, it's real, it happens. It happens in humans as well as uh, animals. Now this is my poor dog, Jack, who has in a very strict exercise program. Uh, you take three balls out and throw them up a hill and he goes up, runs up and grabs it and comes back down and not gonna drop it, but I have another one. So then I, I throw that up and he drops it and then keeps going. And uh, we do that for about 20, 30 minutes. And then what happens? Well, <laughs> it's what I call the Jack effect. He can really take notes for me, and uh, which I appreciate. And, and then, of course, remember he has ADD and he can get uh, you know, has his own will. So this is what happens when he doesn't uh, have his uh, uh, exercise period. <laughs> now what's, what's amazing is when we started to branch out and took, took uh, they took Naperville on the road and they went into the inner city where most of, the, a lot of the work I've been doing is done. Um, <clears throat> And they went to a school in Kansas City, an elementary school where most of the kids were indigent, uh, diff difficult home situation. They had, the year before, had, had their PE class once a week. They went to five days a week, and mainly in the morning. Um, and they didn't have much equipment. They were just running, running games, get to caught heart rate monitors, uh, had a couple of dance sense revolution machines and uh, some exercise bikes. But mainly it was being active for 30, 35 minutes in the morning. Well, what they did is they looked at their fitness gram and after the year, and uh, their fitness grams went way up, especially the pacer test or the, uh, the cardiovascular fitness test which w went skyrocketing, uh, you know, 200% improvement. But what also was a shock was that they found a 63% decrease in discipline problems. 63% over the year, over the course of the year. So it wasn't just about novelty. They're also, uh, the teachers were reporting, the kids were sitting and coming into class, paying attention, being more cooperative, being better citizens. Uh, then another school down in Charleston, South Carolina picked up on what I was talking about and they decided they're gonna, they're gonna do, they're gonna change things. They had a, a PE program in this uh, K through eight charter school that wasn't very effective. So the, the PE teacher decided she was gonna get all the kids in the grades four to eight, 125 of them in the gym at the same time. And she set up eight different stations around the gym. That's all they had. And so in one they'd play basketball, another they'd do jump rope, another they did pogo stick, they did 
cup stacking. They did. They had a couple of dance dance revolution machines. And what she did is she blew her whistle every eight minutes, so they switch. So they were constantly sort of, uh, uh, you know, they did three stations a morning. Well, what they found in the first four months, compared to the year before, was an 83% drop in discipline problems. Okay, in the course of the year, it was about 50%. Uh, and a subsequent drop in the days, in suspended days. The teachers obviously felt this was great. They, the kids were more there, more present, more ready to learn, more uh, on point. Then we, <clears throat> this past year, in February last year, we went up to Northern Ontario to this, uh, this school in Barrie, Ontario, middle class, lower middle class school, where we uh, help them develop a program for the the one of their classes. These were this is a high school, and they had a special class that they'd had for a couple years for their 25 bad boys, 25 most difficult kids. Okay, so we help them think about how to get these kids moving every morning. Uh, and what would work. And so, and using a lot of student participation, figured out what kinds of activities would they would do, and but very intense. So, <clears throat> the quarter before, with those 25 kids, they had 94 days of suspension, which is what they did up there. If they couldn't handle the kids, they would suspend them from school. They started this program, and in the next quarter, the suspensions were five. Subsequent improvement in attendance, obviously, and improvement in uh, getting through their, their credits, getting through high school. These kids were all in between juvenile uh, hall and uh, some were uh, First Nation kids, so the reservation. But they started to come to school because here was something that they could begin to be successful about. There's a, a, a principal in, in, in Fort Collins, Colorado, had come up with an, uh, a, a variant of this, and he, he changed the time out of his elementary school kids to time in, where he'd have them exercise. If they were too outrageous in class, uh, acting out, they would, instead of sending them to him, he would put them into an exercise uh, action and saw the change because what we're doing is we're turning on when you exercise even for five minutes when you exercise you turn on this part of the brain that that part of the brain the, the ceo the guide for the brain and a big part of what it does is it blocks out impulses it 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 uh it, it stops impulsive activity speaking out jumping around being too fidgety in class so by just having these five minute breaks uh, for these kids that were really acting out, they really uh, came up with something. Now, a couple bonus slides here. Okay, it's never too late to begin. You know, this is for your parents and some of you. Um, here we have Ernestine Shepherd. At the age of 56, she was a fat check, as she described herself, a couch potato. She'd always been heavy. So she decided she's going to get fit. This is her at 74. Running marathons. She was on the cover of the Washington Post Sunday Magazine a couple years ago. Uh, and she runs programs for the elderly. Uh, and it, it can happen. We have that capacity. Now, more impressively is my friend over here, Mr. Singh, who at the age of 80, had been sedentary all of his life, but had lost his wife and his son to illness in Toronto. Been sedentary, got very depressed, and started to run. Here he is at the age of 100, finishing the Toronto Marathon. It's never too late. Now, at Harvard, this is myself and 
Dan Lieberman, who's known as a barefoot professor who changed the shoe industry, and you see that, okay. And then Chris McDougall, who wrote Born to Run for all your runners. He's, he's uh, a savant and then the president of Harvard. We started a thing called Harvard on the Move to get our students moving. Now, 70% of our students, you don't have to get them moving because they're already moving. They're in great shape uh, participating and, you know, they, they, they've lived the value of it. But 30% of them are probably not moving. They're couch potatoes. They sit and then sit and they get stressed and everything. So we've started a bunch of programs where we have the walking and running and hopefully going to do a half marathon maybe next year, uh, the Harvard Half Marathon. We have a program especially from the couch to the 5K for kids that are really not moving because those are the ones we really want to get. That's what Naperville was able to do. They got everybody involved, not just the, the people who would do it anyway. They got everybody involved, and that's where the miracle was, really, that, that they pulled off. Now, as uh, your professor mentioned, I, I've had some big success in, in, in various countries, especially in the Far East, in Japan, and this is in Taiwan, there I am with the president. We had just finished a 3K run with 7,500 Taiwanese on Sunday morning at 6.30. Uh, and he had me up on stage and interviewing me and interviewed me and about changing the whole climate in Taiwan of activity. He wants to make it the sports island. He had read my book, invited me over, had his people get me over there. Uh, and he's a Harvard Law School graduate, so there was a little bit of a, uh, action there. But he was also an ex-triathlete. So when he read my book, he said, okay, he, this is the advantage of having a centralized government, change PE from two hours a week to three hours a week. Just like, boom. Fiat. So... And I, now I'm in, very involved with uh, Taiwan and, and sports universities, uh, especially, but uh, because they really are serious about getting their kids moving and keeping them uh, active, and it, and then working with the elderly. And there I am in in the uh, his palace. He had me on TV. Anyway, uh, that's that's it. So I think. It's just something that we're so aware of now. It, there's a lot of evidence. It's not just sitting in an armchair saying, oh, it's good for you. It really, we know, we know, we know scientifically that exercise really has an effect on our mood regulation, on our anxiety, on our stress level, on addictions, and on learning. It optimizes our ability to learn. So thank you all for your attention, and God be with you.